<clears throat> it's good to be with you this week um, and today. And I want to take about 15 minutes just to share with you some of our experiences in working with data and metrics um, with federal and state governments, and more importantly, what we've learned from the experiences uh, of others. Um, Leslie, is your mic on? Well, that's what I'm asking. I don't think, it doesn't sound like I'm alive. Yeah. Number four. Put it up. I can also bellow. I have two young girls. I'm very young. All right, is this, it's not, it's not working. Sorry, I'll be loud. Okay. <clears throat> so I want to start really by acknowledging that we uh, live in data overload. Uh, this is no surprise, no secret to any of us. Uh, how can we possibly focus and prioritize? Um, we have tremendous focus on monitoring. <laughs> oh, watch. Do this behind scene. So I was uh, just describing the burden that we deal with monitoring and evaluation and the focus on these metrics. And, and you know, despite the good efforts of many, we find ourselves swimming in this uh, sea of often you know, mediocre data, fragmented, duplicative perhaps irrelevant, not tied directly to the metrics that we're most interested in. And uh, so we need to uh, work together to focus on a key set of metrics, of indicators that will serve us well, that we can measure well, uh, and that we can use really across the strategic problem solving continuum. So not only for monitoring evaluation, but way in the beginning, you know, clearly and explicitly defining and identifying problems that we want to address, doing a systematic industry of strategy. Ultimately, of course, doing monitoring by the That's not the only way to help us. We can use it to help inform evidence based decision making, we use good data, and are Lots of reasons to focus our energy on patient Part of the problem, and the reasons we find ourselves circumstances, a general unturned up in good problems. But there are a couple of other things, I think, that, uh, that challenge And the first is uh, the lack of good measurement. The second is perhaps insufficient or inappropriate methods of data. And the third is our challenges to create a compromise. When we heard from um, Dr. Marpla uh, on Monday and statistics health very big question. You know, like you don't know, what's the meaning of life? So what is the denominator? It's a good question. It's a very important question. For some of us you know, it's creating some So as we think about uh, prioritizing amongst this uh around of data. We uh, have some approach, some way to, to look at the cost and benefit. Uh, there are some criteria that can help us. The first and most fundamental are the data value and reliable. And this depends to a large extent on the quality of measure and the appropriateness of the methodology. So, for example, we have limited data on health beliefs and health And we can't possibly hope to solve this problem by simply dropping a few more items in this case. We need to really think creatively about alternative forms of data collection as well. Qualitative, mixed methods, approaches, like participatory model. He's also great promise. We need to do more work on validation. And to my mind, especially looking at possible of instruments built in place A, ship up. I'm thinking of uh, of Zellery's comments with the great comments about self regulation. Try to regulate something. I, I'm very passionate about the idea of data measurement myself. 
So I'm going to regulate and go to the next bullet. Um, are the data relevant? Because this is just very straightforward, but not so easy to do. Are they relevant? And that's to give great examples of solving applications without some access to emergency services. Wait time. And we can actually process it virtually. Increase stock out. We're really the only thing that will tell us whether we've achieved this goal is wait time. You know, using a clock, a good battery, using it consistently, and starting it when we have onset of Third, are the data available? You know, can they be gathered efficiently? Uh, so we have limited information in terms of coverage you know, primarily facility based reporting. But we can do better on this site. We also can think uh, broadly about alternative data, so the translation. And two first of them data to shed light on one given health. So we can't wait covered statistics and think about embedding items in population features. And looking at that in conjunction with availability across uh, are the data credible? This can be quite engaging stakeholders in the identification of nectar can really help. About a strategy engagement in North Park work about bringing safety on Earth into the process. We do this in our uh, in the positive thinking that I and others do. Uh, we very early on bring safety into the process. Help both emanation of the fact. Instrumental and can also help credibility. Why the public data? And then lastly, are the data of work. You know, can they get in a way uh, that, that is sustainable? And there are multiple ways of thinking about credibility and efficiency of data collection. So if we are mindful of data collection strategies, when we're identifying methods, sometimes we have these active circumstances we can find one data collection method that allows us to collect the additional. And we also, again, capitalize, I think, on statistics. Think about dead data collection efforts in finding achieve This requires you know, several that are measured well, that are perceived as credible and relevant, that are fed back to them. And there will be investment on the practitioner side, on the country, in terms of generating confidence. So these criteria can help us in thinking about relative benefits. I want to take just a couple minutes to encourage us to think even more broadly. Other sources of intelligence or information assessing see of that trying to inspire. And the first, it can be useful to assess political, social, economic plans when we're thinking about that of that. What are the political and economic obstacles to a mind set of who went? Sam Blue. The government's illustration was fantastic on Monday afternoon about how now maternal mortality is made Seizing this moment, you're the president of Liberia, both the UAO, both the Commissioner of Mortality, and both now the Chief of All. David, in We also want to be mindful of the influence of the ethnic on the landscape itself. It's, it will shape the landscape. Greater than the so the metrics we choose will shape uh, ethnic. Uh, financial, how services are organized, how services are organized. 
then the last sort of um, point to maybe make with this illustration is that you know, the landscape is and the horizon is far away. And so there are infinite number of metrics that we can choose. Fading you know, again. So it becomes important that you know ultimately we need to focus again on this key set of priority metrics uh, that we can have confidence in, that we can measure well, and we can apply. I also want to invite us to consider alternative uh, sources of data and innovative methods of data collection. So you know, use of PDAs and cell phones for frontline gathering of data on the front lines. You know, tremendous potential here. <coughs> I'm actually having a response to this picture of this Android phone. My, my husband is a software developer, and so he bought us these Android phones, and I cannot use it to save my life. I, I can't answer it. I hang up on Betsy constantly. I send these random emails, like blank emails, because there's a button that is sensitive. I just, I can't look at the screen. Um, but so very important to invest, obviously, in the training of the use of these. No question. Again, you know, Dr. Ruffle and I had time on Sunday, and so I got to hear some wonderful stories. And the scale up of IT is my mind's phenomenal. You know, training 500 health workers in the field to use computers now. And you describe them as computer folks. You know, so this is no uh, easy task, but certainly has tremendous uh, potential. And I think we want, everybody's watching Wanda, Phones for Health. What's going to happen here as this rolls out? How will this actually work? You know, we have a brilliant MD-PhD student here with exactly this interest, Lewis, and so I hope he's had time to talk with the wonders about this. And then lastly, of course, we need to build and sustain our human capital resources. This is critical. We can have technologies and promise and ideas about a fixed set of metrics, uh, but we need the human resource capacity. And so the first thing, uh, really imperative, is an inventory of our talents and limitations. What, what does the human capital workforce look like relative to data? We've just gone through this research skills inventory in our GHLI group. You know, who is good at what? Where are our strengths? Where are our limitations? <coughs> we don't have any limitations. <laughs> Not me. No. Right. Not me. You know, where do we need to grow? Where do we need to build our capacity? These inventories can really be incredibly helpful. We. Um, also want to think, you know, statistics is one thing, and building capacity in statistics and in qualitative methods of participatory models, these are skills. But in data collection, I think we have some room to move. We can be a little creative. I um, was involved a little bit in a project focused on frail, older adults homebound in the community, you know, at high risk for depression. And this group developed an intervention where they trained the deliverers of the meals, of the hot meals, were trained to do a two-item depression screening uh, scale highly reliable and almost you know, free to have done. I, and I'm going to share that paper with Angela and with anybody else who's interested. So thinking broadly about our resources. We also, of course, need to invest in our uh, capacity building. And at multiple levels, and at all at the same time, you know, in individual training, in groups, in teams, in facility level training, and, and more broadly in systems. And these things need to run in tandem. Right? We can't really do one without the other. Dr. Barkler talks about the ramp up of IT there, it was happening all at once, you know, individual levels and system building and getting the PCs out to the um, health, or the rural health areas as well. And then lastly, if we decide, and I think we want to think about this, of it, to embed data collection in delivery and financing systems, we really need to engage those partners. Really very um, upfront, early on, very clearly, you know, where they believe that the metrics are relevant to their work, where they're credible, where the data are fed back in a timely way. We really can have that partnership with data collectors uh, in the field. So all of those criteria can help us. I want to close with um, sort of one observation. David Berg, you know, we work a lot with David Berg, and he always encourages us to put these tensions right out on the table. So, uh, and I wanted, I should add here, policymakers and researchers. I think we, we share this. Tension. Uh, experience tension in needing data and yet not wanting to share it. You know, we need benchmarking data in order to assess our current state and determine our progress toward our goals, but it's risky to share it. You know, it's risky uh, on many levels. The evidence performance data may discredit a program or policy or person. 
So we need to aspire, I think, to a culture where we have data transparency. This is no easy task. Uh, there are things I think we can do to foster data transparency. And to my mind, again, I'm going to have um, impulse control or whatever. I want to talk more about this, but happy to talk about it at any other place and in our workshop in a little bit. Uh, I'll be working with the uh, librarian group. Uh, strong reproducible science. You know, use of good measurement technology and appropriate methods. Methods that are suitably aligned to the metric we're trying to measure. This is imperative, I think, as a foundation. Um, audit capability and systems, you know, very important. You know, in our work, nobody wants to build the audit trails. It's like dirty housework, nobody wants to do it. But we do it, you have to do it. And you know, this is a duty, in my view, you know, to create comprehensive, clear audit trails where we have primary data, post data collection adjustments, you know, all of the assumptions that underlie information <coughs> models, all of these things clearly spelled, spelled out others to review. This can be um, very helpful to fostering a sense of uh, trust. And then lastly, this is the hardest to do, I think, but to create a non-punitive environment where problems, challenges, you know, are really viewed as opportunities for learning, where we have this shared view of learning from our mistakes. Now, this is not easy either. We uh, have struggles, bumps in the road in our research. I've had a few lately where I'm like this, and then I go, okay, wait, it's learning opportunity, it's learning opportunity, <laughs> learning opportunity. <laughs> uh, but this is important to really embrace these challenges and, and learn how to improve going forward. Difficult to do. I am going to pause and thank you. Uh, and then I want to just let you know, too, that um, people seemed interested when Peter Salovey pointed to some references and resources. And so I added this stuff to my slides and sent it to these guys at 11 o'clock last night. And I get emails back right away from Brian and Dave. Oh, it's okay. It's no problem, Leslie. <laughs> we'll have all of these articles. We'll have your slides fixed. And we'll have all of these articles in electronic form for the delegates on Friday. Anyway, but these are useful papers. They're useful to me, to us, and our work. There's a little series of four in the Lancet that are useful, and a couple of others in the bulletin uh, WHO. And stuff. So these will be in a CD-ROM that you'll be getting as your parting gift. <laughs> for the week. So I'm going to turn it over to Harlan. Thank you for your attention early in the morning.